So uh, the first question we have for you is, you've, you've been involved in the political arena for quite some time. What is the most interesting or inspiring thing you've seen in U.S. politics uh, since you've been involved? Well, the, you know, the fact that I can name more than one politician that has read all the same books that I've read, that has, has created popular social movements based around the ideas of liberty. Mm -hmm. uh, when I first started walk, working in Congress in ancient times, there was one congressman that was interesting in that way, and it was Ron Paul. Yeah. And now um, there's a block of votes mm -hmm. in the Senate and the House, and you know a lot of these names, Justin Amash, Thomas Massey, Rand Paul, Mike Lee, others as well. And as frustrated as we might be that, that um, the, the, the libertarian moment that American politics talked about hasn't happened yet, appreciate that as a social movement, um, politics is a lagging indicator. And we are in the middle of a very disruptive period in, in American politics. And I think, I think the future is ours if we're willing to, to tackle it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, we start to see that list of politicians who care about liberty grow. And many of them aren't perfect, but more of them become, uh, more, of them become more like us every day. And I think that's a, that's a positive uh, a po certainly a positive thing and a testament to the, the work that you've been doing over the years. You know, this morning, the biggest critics of Donald Trump's decision to bomb Syria were Republicans. And that is unusual. All parties fall in line, and Democrats criticize Republicans, and Repu Republicans criticize Democrats. But Liberty Republicans, more often than is usual in politics, speak truth to power. Yeah. Yep. Uh, the next question is a, quite a funny one. So George asks, you're an anti-socialist, but you have a mustache like one. Can you explain that? <laughs> so here's the deal. The commies have been stealing all of our cool stuff forever. <laughs> they stole the word liberal. They stole the word community. Um, before Adolf Hitler, Ludwig von Mises sported a beautiful toothbrush mustache, and freaking Hitler ruined it. <laughs> the commies are not going to steal this stash from me. <laughs> so, speaking of, uh, speaking of Donald Trump, um, this is our next question. He has expressed some support in terms of the right to try. Are you optimistic that this could be a change that we see in the near term? Yeah, there was, um, um, Donald Trump is right on this, and apparently um, it's an issue that, that Jared Kushner cares a lot about. Um, sometimes Donald Trump's positions on any issue can be sort of a random walk, sort of like going to a casino in Vegas. You don't know if you're <laughs> gonna win or not. Um, but in this case, the, uh, the, the challenge was actually the Republican House. And they, they, they tried to pass it on a voice vote and it failed, they came back and they passed it. But the dirty secret about right to try is that, that big pharmaceutical companies don't like it because it sort of breaks up their cartel and allows smaller investors to, to bring drugs to market without, without control and this very expensive $350 million 12-year process. So I, I'm optimistic, but I understand that the vested interests in the political process probably don't want it to happen. Yeah, yeah. So moving from, I mean, you tell your story, it's, it's quite a personal story. Can you explore, walk us through the process of realizing that in order to really spread the ideas, you have to tell stories? Yeah, well, I mean, that story, my wife would tell you, I, I haven't told that story in, how long has it been? I didn't want to tell that story, um, but I got kind of pissed off about some of the idiots in Washington, and I, I thought I would bring it to them at that level. But I also figured if I want other people to tell those, those very personal stories, I had to put my money where my mouth is. Mm -hmm. and, and the beautiful thing about storytelling is that it's all about a person, and it's probably someone 
that if, if you don't know them personally, it's someone that reminds you of someone in your family, your mother, your father, your sister. And, and I think us putting a human face on the policies that we care so much about, yeah. um, libertarians aren't very good at that, <laughs> no. as you may know. But, so I figure if, if I can do it, anybody should be able to do it. Yeah. And so, I mean, in terms of your own personal journey outside of, of this being a passion of yours and obviously beer, um, walk us through your, like, how did you become who you are today in terms of your political views? Was, was there an aha moment? Did the penny drop? Or was it something that just kind of you gradually had chip away? Um, I was a very strange child. <laughs> and um, one day I bought an album by a band called Rush. And it was called 2112, and, and I didn't even know who they were, but I'd heard it, and I knew it was awesome, and I'm rocking out. And, and back in the day, you had these vinyl record sleeves that had all the liner notes inside. And this particular album was dedicated to the genius of Ayn Rand. I'm, I'm 13 years old. I don't know who this dude is. <laughs> but I stumbled across one of her books, Anthem, soon after that, and I devoured it, and, and I became obsessed as, as a teenager about these ideas. Um, it's a horrible way to meet girls, but it's a great way to learn about liberty. <laughs> yeah, I can see you now trying to date and, and asking people if they've... <laughs> I took a copy of Atlas Shrugged on a date, and it ended the date almost immediately. <laughs> so we're, words for, for all the single, single individuals out there, don't, maybe don't bring a copy of Atlas Shrugged on your first date. Um, back to, to U.S. politics and, and the implications of the right to try or medical cannabis, which is another issue you've touched on. We're seeing more and more now where Americans are losing their right to bear arms simply by having a license for medical cannabis. Do you mind giving us your take on what is causing that to happen, given that firearms rights are supposed to be something that are that is so enshrined in the American na uh, narrative. It's a very weird dynamic because in very liberal progressive states like Hawaii, where medical cannabis is, is legal, I think recreational is legal in Hawaii as well, um, the government is also run by people that, that absolutely don't believe that you should be allowed to own a gun. Conversely, you have conservatives that, that, that view the Second Amendment as, as almost a, a statement of religious belief who aren't that wild about legalizing cannabis. So it's this weird collusion where all the individual rights fall aside and, and both parties' big government tendencies come mm -hmm. to the forefront. It's, it's a slippery slope. That's why you shouldn't accept um, the idea that... Um, you know, I, I just don't think there should be caveats on medical cannabis. I don't think there should be caveats on the right to defend yourself mm -hmm. because the bureaucrats will use it to take your rights away. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's when we see both parties come together. I think the, the joke is the scariest thing to hear in politics is bipartisan effort. That's how you know you're getting the worst of... Everybody uh, gets screwed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so in terms of... The, the landscape between, let's say, Republicans and Democrats. Do you see a future for Liberty Democrats? Well, I think the, um, I, you know, I call it the two-party duopoly. Like, it's, it's, for me, it's getting harder and harder to tell the difference between Republicans and Democrats, at least in how they actually act. Mm -hmm. They say different things, but they tend to do the same things. And you were seeing with the rise of, of the Tea Party, before that, the Ron Paul movement. Before that, Howard Dean, whose campaign manager famously wrote a book saying that the revolution will not be televised. First step in, in, first me in, in social media and politics. And fast forward to Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, there's, there's all of these disruptive things happening in politics that I think are driven by technology and the fact that more people have access to different ideas mm -hmm. and ability to self-organize, to self-fundraise, Justin Amash would not be a congressman if it wasn't for these disintermediating forces. So my, my take today is that we're in the middle of a very big paradigm shift. Yeah. And Donald Trump is, is a symptom of that paradigm shift, but I don't believe that his brand of nationalism is where we're going. I think we're going 
to a world where, where people, particularly young people, grow up thinking that everything is at their fingertips. They get to choose everything. They get to curate their communities. They get to um, live a fundamentally cosmopolitan life in a way that I could not have imagined. And of course, of course Ludwig von Mises said that liberalism, the classical sense, yes, the good type. was fundamentally cosmopolitan. We understood that there were common human values across race and mm -hmm. politics and nationality. And I, I think I'm, I'm a romantic about technology and I, th I, think, I think that's why we need to, to so much focus on how to use it better. Yeah. Yeah, using it to continuously highlight that the answer to our problems is not isolating ourselves and, and, and becoming more nationalistic. It's in to, to embrace that global cosmo, cosmopolitan libertarian worldview. Absolutely. So this next question is, is certainly going to be close to your heart. What does socialism do to beer? Socialism. So we, we came up with this very scientific... Um, study, and I claim that we have an eco econometric model to back this up, but it's, it's sort of a lie. Um, <laughs> we believe that when you go to your local grocery store, wherever you live in the world, and you look at that beautiful wall of craft beer that more and more often you find, no matter where you live, that is some metric, that's some sort of index for how free you are as a country. Mm -hmm. And it started with the realization, I read this article a couple years ago about Cerveceria Polar in Venezuela had, had run out of ingredients to make beer. And if you guys see the kind of crap that's going on in Venezuela today, you, you fully appreciate that socialism in all of its hellish realities would be better with a cold six pack. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. I think that certainly deserves an applause. So, in, in, in wrapping up, we'll, we'll have one or two more questions. The next one is uh, a ref almost a bit of a reflecting moment and, and forecasting what you see for the future. So, you were in the trenches in terms of the Tea Party movement. You've seen the rise of... of Liberty Republicans and, and kind of the reemergence of, of classical liberalism in terms of the political discussion. Where do you see our ideas, our movement in five years, in ten years? I think that, I mean I think there's going to be more choices in politics. I think I think the uh, the political establishment is is cracking up, and you know I hope that 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 libertarians, um, broadly speaking, small L libertarians, yes. yeah think of a way to capitalize on that. Um, but I do think that, that politics is downstream of values mm -hmm. and culture and ideas and human relationships and all the things that actually make civil society function. So as for, for all the work that we've done in politics, we've, we've tried to go upstream yeah. and, and apply a fundamentally different model. And, it, and again, it goes back, you know, if. When you're playing in Republican politics, you're playing by someone else's rules. Yeah. And, and we broke the rules a few times, but every time we break the rules, they try to change the rules again to stop us <laughs> yeah, move the goal from post. doing it again. Yeah. So, so will you see another Rand Paul? Will you see another Justin Amash? Maybe not, because you know, they might have to leave the Republican Party. They may have to start a new party. It may not be the Libertarian Party, could, but it could be this broad umbrella of people that generally just want to be left alone as long as you don't hurt them or take their stuff. Yeah, yeah, that small L, classical liberal libertarian perspective. Um, in closing, uh, this is a great question that, that just came in. If you could get rid of one thing the US federal government does, what would you get rid of? Stroke of a pen. I, I would get rid of permanent war. It's the most corrosive thing that we do as a country. Absolutely. So thank you, Matt, for joining us. Thank you for coming all the way to Belgrade to talk to a Canadian in front of a, a fully, a, a variety of uh, people from a variety of different, uh, not only European countries, but countries from all over the world. Uh, I couldn't think of a better way 
to close out the conference and highlight that cosmopolitan approach than to do exactly what we're doing with the audience that we have here. So uh, once again, thank you on behalf of everyone. Thank you, guys. So, in, in closing, I, um, before we, we will have a short video and, and closing speeches from the conference organizers, um, I, there, is, there are two final announcements that uh, I have to announce. So the first is um, that there is a social at Club Fabrica tonight, and the first drink is on SFL. Uh, we have the picnic tomorrow, which will have food and beers, but it's a picnic, so feel free to bring uh, your own uh, food and beverages as well. Um, for those attending the Liberty Dinner, which is invite only, uh, you, after this, gather in the main hall. Uh, there'll be volunteers with signs who will take you uh, to taxis to take you to the venue. And in, in closing, at least for my, my, uh, my involvement in this conference, I think it's important to realize that 40 years ago, a conference like this here in Belgrade wouldn't be possible. It would be illegal. We would not be able to, to congregate together and talk about these ideas. And so I think the fact that in such a short period of time, despite turmoil and communism, we're here talking about these ideas, fighting for a freer country here in Serbia, a freer continent in Europe, and more importantly, a freer world. And so with that, uh, I, I bid all of you adieu. Thank you very much. We will uh, have a closing video and closing speeches uh, momentarily. Thank you.